yours. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and um, I'm really delighted to be now part of this uh, of this community. So I look forward to that party as well. Um, okay, uh, so yeah, I'm going to present today. Um, is is uh, well a bit of an overview of my work, but also I wanted to reflect on more a uh, bit more philosophical issues and how my work um, can be thought of as. Um, a tool for uh, interdisciplinary research. And I'm going to begin, have kind of three parts. I'm gonna start by giving a bit of background on, uh, uh, on myself and, and, uh, and the work I've done. Then I'm going to talk about emotions and what they are um, a little bit so that um, for people who are less familiar, uh, to give them an idea why interdisciplinary research is key um, to, to address this topic. And then I'm going to, um, talk about how robots can be um, can be used for to support this research and, and provide some examples um, also from, from my work. Okay, so um, and okay, so I had to use the key. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, let us start about uh, me. So um, uh, well, as Flora said, I, um, I have a bit of a, an uh, interdisciplinary background. So I studied philosophy uh, for seven years and um, in Madrid. And then I did a PhD in computer science and um, uh, artificial intelligence in uh, Paris 11, it's now Paris Saclay. Uh, then I went on to, uh, to do something completely different. I started doing uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence, but a, a completely different kind, uh, which we call embodied um, artificial intelligence in postdocs at, uh, at MIT uh, in the US and in Belgium and then uh, in, uh, in Spain, uh, Scientific Research Council. And then um, uh, between 2001 and, and 20, I was uh, at the University of Hertfordshire, where I had uh, led a lab in uh, embodied um, cognition, emotion and interaction. Um, and um, I was also leading a, a, the, um, you know, a group in AI and robotics. <laughs> and I'm here. Uh, so uh, my my research uh, focus since uh, since I started my postdocs actually uh, 95 uh, has been on modeling affect and uh, and emotion um, as as one of uh, the affective states um, with two objectives in mind. So um, actually, I started uh, I kind of discover uh, emotions when I started working with uh, with robots. Oops, I don't know why this is in this. Okay, uh, so I started, uh, yeah, this color emotion when I when I started working on robots, uh, autonomous robots. Um, um, so as a philosophy student, I hadn't really be, uh, you know, concerned with, with this issue or when I did uh, other uh, kinds of AI. So uh, let's see why. Uh, so I wanted to build, uh, you know, better, better autonomous and social robots that can make better decisions and, and interact socially um, and use <laughs> affect as, as to guide and improve uh, this, this element. And uh, from this perspective, I want to, um, you know, uh, use affective robotics of affective computing, uh, um, aff modeling affect as a computer science discipline. So give it a, like a proper, uh, you know, uh, status of a scientific discipline. Uh, so building computational model, uh, models in, uh, in a very methodological way and, and performance metrics and, um, you know, do this quantitatively as well. But I also want to contribute to the to understanding affect, human affect and other animals as well. Um, so also plays this as, as, um, as part of the affective sciences, a discipline of affective sciences. And what robots can, can do uh, is to, to contribute to understanding theoretical models better because you have to uh, really think of the mechanisms that you need to implement in the robots and to operationalize and then um, carry out systematic analysis. So it adds uh, lots of thinking and lots of uh, trying to be precise at this. So my approach is, uh, is not just uh, modeling um, external uh, elements of, of the motion, but really trying to give uh, robots give robots emotions, so an, an internal emotional system uh, of the sorts, um, what I call strong uh, emotion modeling approach. 
um, and and um, I call what I what I do um, affective cognition, embodied affective cognition, and I take inspiration from from biology. Okay, so let's um, uh, see. Uh, so I'm going to talk mostly about emotions, but of course, um, affective phenomena are uh, many, and they're all related, they're relevant, they're different as well. Um, but I'm going to focus on um, two of them mostly motivations. Um, I, I've been focusing mostly on motivations and um, and uh, and emotions. Okay, so what do I, I mean by uh, embodied affect? Well, it's much more than the fact that I am using robots, obviously, uh, and and more than uh, just using the expression of emotions with the body or the face and recognizing human emotions. What I mean is really beyond this uh, shape aspect, and I model. Um, you know what happens in through the body in and through the body when uh, um, we are we um, and uh, other animals are in uh, emotional states experiencing emotions. So I model uh, the internal uh, dynamics and and processes uh, down to simulating um, you know a physiology that is um, tries to uh, be a model of uh, homeostatic control and hormones that act on that uh, physiology. And I also uh, model the external, um, you know, elements of emotions, external manifestations, and the trade-off uh, of inter <laughs> interactions between kind of the internal environment and the external uh, environment. And this raises many questions, such as, you know, can I use uh, mechanisms that are um, similar across different environments, across different species, um, for example. Um, and so by affect, I, I already said a little bit, but um, what I mostly mean is the, uh, in an intuitive way, the wanting and the liking, so motivational uh, and emotional processes and how they interact uh, between themselves and with other uh, cognitive um, elements. So wanting would be motivation for action and for cognition, uh, for interaction as well. We're motivated to, we're curious, uh, seeking novelty. Um, and they, uh, uh, emotion aspect uh, is, is mostly uh, the liking or disliking what we do perceive, know, learn, um, etc. And this is key for us, but also for robots if they had to be kind of autonomous and interact with us, because it makes things matter um, to us. It's kind of a driving force uh, for everything, for cognition and, and action. Um, so I take the view that affect and cognition are really uh, very uh, closely closely related. Uh, and as I said, I take an embodied artificial intelligence approach, which focuses in the dynamics of interactions between agents and, and their environment and the mutual influences. <laughs> and um, you know, embodied affect in this uh, context allows to ground a bunch of notions that are key um, in for robots, like autonomy, adaptation, learning, development, evolution, interaction dynamics. Um, so we're gonna be uh, seeing a little bit of this. Okay, a very quick um, overview of some of the topics that I've been working on. So I've been uh, uh, doing quite a bit of research trying to um, model uh, mechanisms and, and um, taking inspiration from models from uh, different disciplines, but mostly in neuroscience and, um, and psychology that might be underlying um, embodied affective cognition, different elements. So taking inspiration from biology, ethology, cybernetics, and neuroscience mostly, but uh, also the disciplines. Um, so yeah, so as I already mentioned, um, so I've been trying to kind of uh, model the dynamics of, uh, of um, like simple physiology that can be analyzed in a very precise uh, way using, um, you know, um, cybernetics mostly as a, as a tool for this. Um, <laughs> and the, um, um, you know, hormones as uh, one of the uh, mechanisms. I, okay, sorry about this. <laughs> uh, as one of the mechanisms um, involved in uh, emotional states that um, allow to modulate, um, you know, other, other elements um, and, and therefore the cognitive function. Um, so this allows that, uh, you know, the same underlying architecture, as we call it, the same neural network uh, functions in different ways um, under different emotional states. Uh, so, for example, attention is uh, greater to specific kind of stimuli or um, uh, is more uh, narrowly focused or um, perception changes at, at the, um, you know, 
um, action uh, is different. So this sort of mechanisms and, and the dynamics. Um, then I've been uh, also working a lot on um, the role of affect in uh, decision making, uh, using motivational states as the kind of driving force uh, for making decisions and emotions will be kind of the um, more modifiers or amplifiers uh, in the decision making system through this, um, you know, hormonal modulation of uh, goal priorities and different things. Uh, and so assessing the adaptive value of, uh, of emotions uh, in decision making situations. Is it, um, um, you know, do, do they improve things? Do they uh, make them worse in some cases? And trying to understand which cases is one or the other. Uh, so I've assessed this in uh, different kinds of uh, environments and situations like competitive situations, prey predator, also social um, positive um, scenarios. And I've been also looking at the role of uh, pleasure uh, in decision making. Uh, so some sort of simulated a pleasure home and, and it's dysfunctions as well, as well as the role in, in learning, for example, in, in enforcement learning. Okay, another topic uh, that I've uh, touched on is the expression of affect and uh, both through the face and, and through the body, uh, but linking it to the dynamic of interactions more than just, um, you know, try to come up with like a repertoire of uh, postures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, which is about also done, but I'm more interested in uh, in the link, uh, in the dynamics. Um, also, the uh, you know the development of affect as a function of interaction between uh, humans and robots. Uh, so, looking already at the temporal uh, temporal dimension, how emotions become uh, what they are and change through life, uh, so ontogenetically. And I've been using uh, development as a paradigm for uh, for social robots uh, to uh, adapt by themselves by learning from uh, from the interactions with humans uh, to learn to adapt to the humans specific humans they they have to interact with. Uh, so I've been looking at attachment um, and affective forms uh, quite, quite a bit, as well as um, epigenetic processes that um, you know allow for more sophisticated. Um, interactions and also the influence, taking into account the influence of the uh, of the context um, in different ways. Um, and lastly, I've also looked a little bit at, uh, at the evolution of affective systems um, through um, kind of artificial life uh, simulations. And we're going to see a little bit of a little bit of each. Okay, so basically, uh, this summarizes uh, pretty much what I've. Uh, what I've done uh, in the past and uh, grounds also what I would like to uh, do here, which is uh, look at, uh, you know, all the social envelope for this, all the uh, really social component more than envelope. Uh, so the fact that uh, um, affective cognition is uh, embedded in a social context. So these are, um, you know, some of the things I'm gonna be uh, want, uh, looking at here. Um, you know, the, the effects of uh, norms, uh, cultural groups, uh, values, how to develop robots with values, social values, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, okay, so now let's move to the uh, one million dollar question uh, what are emotions? Um, I'm not going to answer immediately at least. <laughs> um, but they're very, um, they're very difficult to define, even to identify. Uh, so it's not always clear. Um, in which emotional state, if we want to talk about states, we, we are uh, other people, is even more difficult. Um, and they involve many, uh, many problems. Uh, for example, um, do they think of them in terms of discrete categories like happiness, sadness, uh, fear, or is it more like a continuum uh, that you know, changes, moves, um, and doesn't necessarily have names? Um, what is uh, pretty much everyone agrees is that uh, it has many, many different uh, aspects, many uh, elements. So physiological, behavioral, cognitive, social, cultural, you name it. Um, so emotion is involved pretty much in um, everything. So they're kind of global, uh, you know, global uh, responses, if you want, coordinated responses of many subsystems that affect um, each other. Um, People tend to, um, theorists 
tend to um, agree, there are three main elements in the development of activation of emotions. So one is the uh, recognition of a significant uh, event um, in, you know, animals that, um, well, it, this can be kind of more um, um, immediate or, or, or more reflective. There are autonomic and visceral uh, responses and <laughs> in uh, species with a uh, nervous system that is complex enough, and emotional experience in the cortex. And uh, different theories um, differ in the relations of, uh, among those, uh, those elements. Um, so the, the causal relations. And uh, so, for example, we have uh, you know, main approaches. Um, Darwinian um, theories about emotions that see them as uh, adaptive uh, mechanisms that uh, arose um, in evolution as responses um, to key uh, survival related events. And there's a basic set and there are associated uh, expressions that are uh, universal somehow. Um, so uh, <laughs> other uh, um, theories uh, take uh, inspiration from uh, from James and they focus on physiological changes and uh, this this physiological changes will be uh, the first uh, step that will trigger the subjective experience other people uh, see the story the other way around so the uh, cognitive uh, conscious elements uh, based on appraisals evaluations conscious evaluations will trigger uh, the rest um, some uh, some theories said that well emotions are uh, the biological ground um, grounding is uh, pretty much insignificant and what matters is that they're socially constructed so they're social products and and uh, linked to roles and they can be fully explained at social level and then um, um, uh, another family of theories that is um, has had, has seen uh, a lot of research in this couple of decades. Um, and a lot of uh, well, progress maybe uh, is neuroscience, neurobiology um, that tries to understand the fundamental brain uh, mechanisms and subsystems involved in, <laughs> in emotions. And three, um, this, well, all of them have, have inspired me, but um, this um, um, kind of approach, um, three main ideas um, have inspired particularly my early work one is the involvement of emotions in, in decision making in social intelligence that was uh, kind of popularized by by antonio damasio uh, the fact that um you know uh, emotional stimuli are processed at different uh at different speeds there's kind of two different pathways so one is uh, fat responses and the other was more reflective uh so how those um you know two different types of responses interact and coordinate is um uh, they're interesting. So that was uh, Ledu, uh, who um, also um, Joseph Ledu, um, talk a lot about this uh, this idea and the uh, evolutionary roots of affective systems. But Jack Panksepp um, has also influenced me uh, quite a bit. Okay, so um, why are emotions interesting? For, uh, for us as humans and for us as roboticists and for robots as, um, as agents. Um, well, the main functions they have, they're um, adaptive mechanisms that allow us to deal with uh, important event related survival, contribute to the internal the equilibrium of the internal environment, the homeostasis, um, and control interactions with the physical and social environment. They also motivate and guide action. So for example, we categorize events as pleasant or unpleasant, amplify or modify motivation, and uh, decision, they, they have play a key role in decision making. And of course, in interaction and communication, they, they have um, a very important uh, uh, you know, uh, there are very important signals as social reference for communication uh, and, and even to construct, um, you know, intersubjectivity. So for all these reasons, uh, they're interested for robots. So let's have a look at one, um, you know, one of the kind of uh, definitions um, that have, um, are particularly important for robots, but also inspire my early um, research uh, Quite a bit. So what emotions are is about action or rather motivation for action and action control, for example. So there are mechanisms to modify, uh, not, the, not, the, not just directly modify the environment, but to modify or maintain the relations between 
an agent and an environment. So it's again about interaction. So for example, anger is a mechanism to block influences from the environment, fear uh, to protect against these influences, sadness to stop an active relation with, uh, when we're not uh, ready to deal with, uh, with something, with a problem. Uh, anxiety diminishes the risk of dealing with unknown environment, um, um, etc. And so in a way they can be seen as a, a monitoring system of the internal and, and external environment. Um, yeah, so I've already given some, some examples of um, controlling uh, interactions, um, so maybe I'll skip this. Uh, so how about robots emotions? Should we take inspiration from, um, you know, from these roles, from the mechanisms, or should we perhaps take into account more uh, the body, uh, the actual body of the robot? So the fact that it has uh, joints that can overheat, uh, batteries that run uh, out of um, energy, um, et cetera, et cetera. So these are, um, you know, can we just um, get away with modeling these uh, simple elements or do we need uh, to model more subtle emotions to, to interact with, with, uh, with humans? I know the issue is how to display, uh, you know, emotional um, internal states in a role in a way that uh, it, uh, speaks to a human, but it's not necessarily um, the same as we as we use. Um, so, well, what is important in, in the case of social robots is, um, you know, uh, using emotions to clearly convey intentions, um, what the a robot is trying to do. Um, you know, and and this also provides a coherent explanation for the behavior that we that we observe. Um, so emotions and personalities can be used as sources of intentions and also explanations about intentions. Um, they can also, uh, emotions can also help humans feel comfortable about the interaction, um, you know, because um, it's something that we expect naturally from, uh, from other agents, but we also have to be careful because this is not the case for everyone um, and we're all different. Uh, so for example, in um, um, you know, autism, um, they, it's not necessarily the case that uh, an artifact that is closer to the human, it feel, makes, makes people feel more uh, comfortable, uh, for example. So they, uh, they also enhance communication, um, nonverbal communication in, in uh, particular, but also, you know, also verbal communication. Um, and hopefully they might contribute to, uh, you know, a, like a deeper understanding so that uh, you know, robots could uh, perhaps understand what we mean rather than not just what we say. So they can also play a role in eliciting and influencing emotions in, uh, in humans and coordinating or negotiating um, interactions. Okay, how we, do we model this? So uh, features that we would like to see, well, lifelike, impression of uh, lifelike, maybe? All these things perhaps are to discuss. Um, uh, believable, it has to be believable so that uh, humans um, engage um, uh, something that shows that we can uh, trust somehow or to what extent, in which aspects we can uh, trust um, the robots. Uh, but I think key is the fact that interaction has to have to be adapted to humans and uh, emotions can contribute a lot here, not just the manifestations of emotions, but affective cognition more. Um, so some of the challenges uh, that we roboticists have is, for example, um, how do we choose which uh, features are relevant uh, in, in emotional displays? Which emotions um, do we use? So what's the level of complexity? Do we use very simple caricaturized emotions or, or very um, faithful portraits of, of the emotions that we understand? Uh, do we just mimic the, uh, the surface, the external manifestations, or do we have to get robots like a, a true uh, emotional system, so robots with, uh, with emotions? These are some of the uh, things that we have to think about. Um, and this is one of the reasons that uh, interdisciplinary uh, research is, uh, is absolutely uh, key. So some of the relevant features um, 
you know, impression of uh, coherent behavior, not just the impression to see in a robot a coherent behavior and personality that stays. So it's, uh, you know, like perhaps a mood that gives rise to a uh, coherent sequence of behavior given, um, given a specific uh, um, situation. Um, phase, and not necessarily a human phase, but um, some elements um, help. Uh, some people and you know like um, see emotion in um, in and in robots um, the body is very important either expression with whole body like postures uh, or specific body parts can can be very expressive like an egg for example um, and both elements static and, and dynamic elements are key movement is also very important to uh, to express emotion but it, it has to be kind of, again coherent uh, well synchronized um, and have the, the right timing um, other elements might be, you know, features that activate uh, what um, I just felt called the, the baby scheme. Um, so some features like big eyes or big head, something that uh, yeah, triggers our uh, always a baby, let's care for it um, kind of um, brain system. And, and vocal inflection is, is also very important. Okay, which emotional well categories, dimensions, um you know do they have to be simple subtle um honest versus fake emotional displays how do we deal with this um, um you know and this erases a lot of issues like privacy and ethical issues as well um to what extent again uh, do we take inspiration from our emotions or we just put something that is road specific but um but actually in the interaction we learn to kind of interpret in a way that makes it understand uh, kind of the um, intentions of the robot or the, uh, the emotional states of the robot. Um, and of course, there are many, many other so sources that um, we can look at. Okay, so, you know, just examples with, um, you know, if, if we go for something very simple, it can have advantages, for example, um, in educational systems, uh, robots interacting with children or trying to teach, uh, for example, um, emotional expressions to, um, they have been using uh, autism, for example, um, uh, very much. Okay, so this has an advantage because it's clear, but it's also, we have to be careful because then we're imposing a view on what emotions are and which emotions are, are important. So we're uh, also, you know, conveying a strong message. This is happiness and nothing else, you know? Whereas um, happiness and, and sadness and, and fear, well, are uh, labels that um, are kind of umbrella terms and, and they can be uh, expressed, they can be uh, lived in a very different ways. Uh, so we have to be very careful with this approach or it can be useful for robots. So we go for uh, dimensions, components of, of emotions like the a positive or negative quality of what we perceive valence or arousal, so the level of activity, like very, um, you know, very intense, very energized, or very um, underpowered, uh, for example. Um, so it's, it's uh, perhaps richer, but maybe um, we can convey such clear messages, although, although we can uh, kind of map uh, so the more discrete categories uh, into this space. Um, another issue that uh, you probably have heard of, uh, many of you, um, is what's called the, the Uncanny Valley hypothesis um, uh, put forward by Masah Masahiro Mori, a, a Japanese roboticist, that, you know, there is a, um, in, in robots and, and other uh, artifacts, um, so there, a, there are um, effective responses in humans as a function of uh, uh, the level of uh, you know familiarity and believability and similarity to uh, to us. So you know the the the, the uh, response is kind of positive uh, up to a point where uh, the similarity is uh, quite high, but not high enough. Uh, then there's a big uh, you know drop, uh, and we have a very negative response. So that's something that we. Um, that we need to uh, to take into account. Okay, so um, just um, you know, uh, from the perspective of uh, yeah of, of interactions between human and robots, um, and from the perspective of uh, improving robots, um, the expressions can help in in very simple ways actually. 
so this is an example of um, you know having to teaching a, a robot a task uh, you know like uh, raising uh, making a, uh, raising an arm um, as a response to what the human is is uh, doing. Um, so um, in this uh, this algorithm, what the uh, robot is is using is predicting the uh, kind of the timing with uh, which the human um, you know moves the arm. Um, so um, you know it would start it by telling um, and this this was done um, this uh, initial work was was done here actually in. in uh, Philip Grossi uh, group. Uh, it is. Um, so, you know, we started telling people, okay, so the robot it will be predicting, you know, your your movement, your rhythm. Um, and people were really too conscious and, you know, could not coordinate really. Uh, so uh, my, my then student, Antonio, had this idea of, okay, let's use, um, you know, more try to, to improve the interaction and make it more natural. Uh, so um, let's allow people to interact with the robot in a, in a way that they feel more natural. So let's, um, for example, people would like to maybe talk to the robot, uh, get some um, you know, feedback on, um, not just feedback on how well the, the uh, program is learning, but some you know, more natural feedback. So we, we um, added some very simple, very sub subtle, a combination of subtle and less subtle uh, affective expressions that would convey, uh, you know, the robot is, is um, doing well or not in, in different ways. So the, uh, you know, the robot was using exactly the same thing, but the interaction um, uh, was very different. And, um, and actually people started coordinating in a, in a very natural way. Um, you know, using these um, more natural uh, um, signals. So they, they started actually coding them quite well and teaching the task uh, much better. So let's have yep. a look. I don't know if people can hear yep. the sound. Yep. So the robot can't understand the no or anything, but just, uh, you know. Okay. You know, a bit impatient. It's not, it's not going well. Okay, here we go. Yes. Yes. And you can see the um, eyes, eyelids. Nope. And uh, provide sense again as well. Yes. 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 There you go. Well done. Okay. So of more settling. Yes. Okay. Let's do. So uh, let's move to the um, you know uh, using robots uh, as <coughs> kind of tools and models to uh, support um, interdisciplinary research on emotion, not just how emotion can can improve robots. Um, and actually. Um, you know, the different um, affective uh, science disciplines um, share a lot of, um, a lot of uh, uh, problems, conceptual problems that were present in philosophy and um, for many years. Um, you know, so some um, of these are, you know, which mechanisms underlie the involvement of emotions in cognition uh, and action in that interaction. Um, Try to understand emotions as different cognitive modes. Um, so our you know, cognition works quite differently under a, a, um, a positive emotional state or a negative emotional state, um, different emotional states. And what are the relations among emotions, value systems, motivation, action? Um, we also have shared challenges, um, for example, trying to understand the origins and meaning uh, of emotions, natural and artificial, the mind body problem uh, keeps popping up. Um, and so how do we uh, untangle this, this knot of cognition, you know, the links between emotion and cognition, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we all have uh, this, uh, this kind of issues. 
so we can uh, we can use robots to model emotions, but we can there are many things uh, that we can model in in, um, in 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 many ways. You know, um, so we can, for example, use uh, robots more as a hypothetical model. So what if uh, you know emotions were this uh, um, you know had these features instead of blah blah. So it's like um, using them for uh, philosophical reflection, uh, uh, maybe to try and have theoretical disparity. Um, you know, this, uh, you know, something with emotions should have these features uh, to come up with thought experiments, uh, which can be very, very, uh, very useful. So that's, that's one of the, uh, the uses um, of, of robots. You know, imagine uh, those, but then the, those uh, those imagine robots can actually be implemented, but maybe or part of them, parts of them. Um, so we can also we can uh, model specific uh, emotional phenomena. For example, we can you know take a theory in your science about um, fear conditioning and and its effects in uh, uh, you know um, learning. Uh, or memory or whatever. And then uh, we uh, make an abstract model. We think of, um, you know, which are the key features that we should uh, put in a robot. Uh, think of an environment that poses the say equivalent challenges that, you know, a natural environment would pose to an animal and, um, you know, define how we're we're going to do the mapping between the, uh, the the properties in the biological system and the interactions and the, in the artificial one, um, you know, design uh, different experimental conditions, run tests, uh, collect results, analyze those, and then uh, you know compare. Well, uh, analyze the the behavior of the uh, of the artificial of the robot, the artificial system, and then go back to the uh, to the biology and um, you know see whether our predictions were uh, right or whether the model behaves in a different way. Why could that be, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So taking specific um, emotions, specific uh, phenomena, um, we could all we can also um, model more more general emotion principles. Um, you know, for example, these ideas about uh, emotions being mechanisms to regulate agent environment interaction so um, you know rather than specific um, emotions we focus more on, on these functions um, so to, to study you know what um, sort of um, principles or dynamics uh, is required to deal with um, you know prevent uh, noxious influences in under the circumstances. And again, we can uh, you know, produce very um, precise um, experimental de uh, designs and run experiments, collect data, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> uh, then we can uh, also model, um, instead of this more uh, specific emotional phenomena, perhaps category, we can, uh, look into the uh, elements of emotions and the dimensions. I, I mentioned valence and arousal. Um, so you know we can uh, we can have models that include different a number of dimensions: valence, arousal, um, you know, um, uh, dominance, um, and and that would be you know an, an abstraction um, on more natural emotions in uh, in our case you know it is very difficult to separate uh, what is arousal from what is valence sometimes um, so it, it all gets a little bit confounded but one thing that we can do with robots we can do uh, an emotional system we can design an emotional system that only has arousal or only has uh, valence or pleasure um, so this single dimensional models um, are a tool to, uh, to try and figure out how much emotion, for example, you can convey with a single dimension or uh, what are the effects on memory uh, or just pleasure or just um, arousal or other things. And then, uh, of course, we have to think of what embodied robots uh, 
contribute versus other, uh, other uh, emotion model like virtual, virtual agents or um, you know, more agent simulations, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so <laughs> um, something that we can also do with robots is, I, I mentioned this at, at the beginning, but um, we can take different perspectives uh, to address this, this big you know, issue of, uh, of emotions and we can produce models on each of these uh, different perspectives. So taking, uh, you know, taking uh, Tim Berger's program for in ethology to understand uh, natural behavior, we can apply it to emotions and we can apply it to uh, modeling emotions in robots and, and so try to understand um, you know, the, the uh, proximal causes of a single organism. So what triggers an emotion uh, at, at a specific point in time? So which are the mechanisms that gave rise to uh, an emotion in a specific situation? Um, or we could try we could try also to understand the adaptive value of that. How does it contribute to the um, you know to, to improve or or uh, or make worse the uh, you know uh, the behavior of the robot their, their value and we can take a uh, historical perspective so the, and 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 look at how emotions form in the robot over time how they change from a developmental perspective or uh, or simulate you know the evolution um, of emotional systems. Um, in you know uh, environments, so a bit of uh, you know, emotions as they could have been, um, as well as try to understand why <laughs> our um, emotions are the way they are because they you know that they they underwent all these um, evolutionary pressures. Um, okay, so if we look at uh, you know a mechanism, so we share with other disciplines questions like you know how does emotion uh, function at different levels so molecular physiological neuroethological cognitive social how these levels relate uh, what are differences based on species embodiments um, how are perception the internal mechanism behavior whatever coupled with environment and some of the hypotheses we can uh, that are relevant for biology and artificial systems uh, and that uh, we can come up in, with in test, for example, are something like, uh, okay, endorphin levels rise during grooming in an actor and recipient. Um, so increased uh, blood flow to muscles uh, when we perceive a danger or the sensitivity to predatory cues increase, uh, increases upon perception of a predator. So we can um, kind of uh, produce mechanisms that would um, you know, have similar, um, uh, effect on, on, on robots. <laughs> and so how can we, uh, you know, some of these mechanisms that we can use. So we can use simple sensory motor connections or so connections between the sensors uh, and the actuators, the wheels or the legs or whatever uh, of the robot in different ways and, uh, you know, with different um, uh, valences and different, that will give rise to, to, to different behaviors. It's very, very simple. Well, we can use, uh, for example, neural networks uh, to model, try to model brain circuits, or we could take um, a dynamical system approach. And for example, you know, ex notions like basic emotions would be explained in terms of attractors. We could, could implement uh, that in the robot. Or, um, you know, we can see um, emotions, for example, as uh, patterns of uh, neuromodulations, which is um, and, you know, the, the approach I mentioned at the beginning, so that our underlying, um, you know, set of uh, neural network or other control, robot controller functions in different ways under different uh, circumstances and <laughs> different emotional states. Uh, so hormonal modulation of the underlying neural circuitry. So these are some of the uh, mechanisms that we can actually implement in the robot. Let's get this. So under adaptation, the perspective of adaptation, um, these are some of the uh, you know questions that we can um, we share and we can uh, implement in robots. So we we wonder here how specific uh, capabilities of perception, uh, memory, learning, etc., that characterize emotional states can benefit the performer, the performer in terms of cost benefits 
for example, in terms of energy expenditures, social proximity, attractiveness. Um, and some examples of hypotheses that we could can test uh, robots is, uh, for example, increased attention to predatory cues, <coughs> increases the chances to escape uh, a predator, but is potentially uh, fatal uh, closely uh, because it um, has makes the robot neglect other vital needs. Or, for example, friendly behavior helps to develop bonds as a basis of reciprocal support. Or social bonding uh, provides advantages for protection against predators uh, for obtaining food and other, um, you know, uh, other advantages. So, <laughs> for example, this, you know, some work that we've done, and it's just implementing both motivational and, uh, and motivations and kind of um, simple emotional uh, like and dislike systems in in robots. As I mentioned, decision making in. Uh, uh, competitive and prey predator scenarios, you know, very simple. Uh, so robots, it's important that the robots must survive and make timely decisions to consume different resources in order to, to do so. And motivations would be, you know, urges to action based on internal bodily needs uh, and influenced by external stimuli, um, both. So, uh, you know, we would have uh, internal variables in the robot, for example, the uh, energy, uh, that we would control homeostatically. So that, you know, there will be an ideal level of energy and an actual level of energy and the mismatch produces an error and that error triggers a set of mechanisms to correct that error. And the set of mechanisms go via the motivational system to trigger behaviors, for example, or other internal regulatory processes in the robot. Okay, so that can be, you know, a, a numeric parameter that we have to keep within a range of numbers for example, and, and also external stimuli perceived through the, uh, through the sensors of the robot. So combining those, uh, we define a number of motivational states using you know, a formula that combines the influences of the internal uh, errors, or we could say needs, and the, uh, the external stimuli. So we, we define a number of these internal variables, and there are a number of uh, resources in the environment that the robot can use to satisfy those needs, so those motivations. The robot might have motivations uh, in parallel, you know, uh, but some of them will be um, higher than others, will be more highly motivated to eat than to, um, uh, than to keep warm, for example, because uh, the need is more intense. And then it can choose uh, a number of behaviors that will uh, satisfy those in a, the best way. And this, the execution of those behaviors is going to change the internal physiology and also their relation to the external stimulus. So it's, it's very simple. And it, you know, what is behind it is just mathematics and, and algorithms. OK, so now we put two and we create uh, two of those. We create a competitive situation. Uh, where robots had to, uh, since they had to consume a resource by being on top of it, so these light and dark patches, um, if another robot is in the same arena, um, well, immediately this creates competition if another robot wants to consume the, the same resource. So in this case, um, you know, one of the things that are key are um, some uh, effective, uh, you know, reactions that would help here might be, you know, push the other uh, if you can, if you're stronger, or give up your weaker, for example, and, and use some opportunistic behavior to go in and look for other resources. So this can be actually um, considered to be an attentional problem. So look at uh, what is relevant in this regard, what is not relevant, uh, so that you don't spend your time, you know, trying to focus on the irrelevant problem. So this can be, you know, achieved by um, releasing this uh, synthetic hormones um, under different circumstances that would change the way uh, the sensors of the robot work or you know how much the salience of what is perceived how salient it is to the robot um, you know in, in in adaptive ways and this would create uh, change the behavior of the robot which would disregard um, you know, things when they're not important and just, uh, you know, mathematically, we only had to add a, like a parameter here that changes, for example, the salience of the uh, external stimulus, and that can be controlled as a function of a synthetic hormone that, um, you know, varies as a function of the interactions of, of the robot with the environment and 
and by monitoring how well um, the internal environment variables are kept, you know, uh, within the, the those limits that uh, are the, the permissible limits. Okay, I'm not going to run this video, but so we can, uh, you know, define uh, quantitative uh, metrics to assess how well the robot maintains the uh, the balance, uh, you know, the well-being, the internal environment, the homeostasis, <coughs> for example. Okay, we can create new situations by giving specific roles, you know, uh, to the robot, one predator, one prey, and a similar mechanism that, um, you know, where this the whole mode would in this case uh, be applied to the perception of the internal damage, for example, something like pain perception. Uh, but adding a property that will be relevant here, which is um, a temporal uh, the property of hormones that stay in the system and that will make um, uh, give rise to uh, some sort of anticipation uh, as the robot is, is uh, exposed repeatedly to the, to the presence of the um, of a predator, for example. Then we can add the like by, um, you know, we see um, things that take the uh, internal environment towards the ideal values of the variable are you know, pleasurable, positive, and uh, behaviors and things that take it away uh, from this uh, nice ideal zone where the variables have are close to their, their ideal uh, state. <coughs> Um, will be uh, negative. So this pleasure or you know pain something we can we can model uh, those um, you know by associating a hormone as a function of those variations um, of uh, of the of the of the variables. And uh, well, we we've run a um, bunch of experiments here. What we have observed is that adding this uh, like pleasure hormone. Um, is going to improve, um, it's going to have an effect on the trade off uh, of the robot between being opportunistic, uh, so taking advantages of opportunities to satisfy a need that is less pressing than the main one, but is actually, you know, uh, good to satisfy a little bit if, if uh, the other one is not too bad, and the persistence, so keep working on a goal. So they, you know, Decision making is a, is a matter of uh, balance between opportunism and persistence. And uh, this pleasure can actually uh, you know, improve that balance under some circumstances. So we can um, um, you know, design experiments to assess under in which circumstances it goes one or the other way. And of course, the excess of opportunism can give rise to impulsivity. Uh, and excess of uh, persistence is related to, can be related to addiction or compulsion and give rise to, to this sort of behaviors also in, in the robot. So just very quickly to show that we can, uh, you know, define like experimental conditions for the robot where uh, it had to consume one or two resources in a timely way. So we can, you know, the design environments where um, uh, there's the same number of uh, each resource and they're very symmetrically distributed uh, or they're, or they're asymmetrically distributed or one of them is, is more abundant than the other. And also there will be, uh, you know, pleasure associated to one or the other uh, to different extents, more or less. Um, different kinds of pleasure as well. So pleasure related to the satisfaction and needs, but also pleasure related to just the uh, execution of the behavior without being related to the fact that they need to be satisfied. Um, anyway, so something that we can do, I'm not going to go into details, but I just wanted to show you that uh, we can, uh, so these are plots of the, uh, how the internal uh, uh, environment uh, changes as a function of what the robot does in, in the external environment, how it moves around and consumes the resources. So we can compare, uh, you know, under different conditions where uh, pleasure is, uh, symmetric for all the resources, but the, you know, the different configurations. So the different different conditions defined here. Uh, and we can very easily say uh, how, you know, the balance um, changes. So if this, this uh, graphs plot, you know, this will be the ideal state where all the, the variables, there's no need all the variables have their ideal state. Uh, the outer limits would be the fatal limit where, you know, the robot would die. 
And so we can see uh, the different conditions. We can see the adding pleasure, or what type or, or the other, or you know, uh, changes uh, how well the uh, internal environment uh, is managed. And we can see how things shift. Um, you know, so for example, condition five would be a case of um, you know, close to addiction and be very uh, maladaptive. And so, um, you know, the second time, um, another example, uh, you know, um, of adaptation is um, how responsive a robot, uh, you know, is, um, how, how well it um, interacts with, with the user. And this will be using only arousal. Uh, to regulate uh, exploration and learning. So it's a robot that has to learn um, things in an environment and novelty um, increases the arousal of the robot that might be too high. So something like stress. Um, so when this affects the, um, you know, the, the um, social motivation of the, of the robot and the uh, expressive system of the robot, uh, we can, see things like this the robot kind of learns just by assessing how responsive the uh, human is how much it attends to its needs how much it helps um, the robot when it's stressed and and it expresses so um, and and also change the way the robot expresses things okay just disregard the graphs which are the internal motivations of the robot here what we see is a robot that has been interacting with a very responsive pair that is just satisfying all the needs. So the robot is very, expresses all its needs, seeks help all the time. <laughs> okay, now it's eating something. Asking for water. It goes to the caregiver. Get, um, the robot is really a spoiled child. Um, here, the robot has been interacting for a while with a uh, caregiver that is very uh, different, very independent, and uh, lives the robot on its own. So it's expressing the same needs in a very different way, in a much more subtle. Uh, okay. But here we see that, you know, the caregiver cares about the robot anyway. So it's just um, you know, part in the robot. And that event is so rare that it's much more significant. Uh, so the robot expresses, uh, expresses um, that with a uh, you know, little bit of um, joy. OK, we can also try to understand um, how emotions might be, uh, you know, might be uh, mechanisms that um, sometimes are maladaptive, but also uh, how to use uh, how to use them to um, um, you know understand perhaps how to um, um, improve uh, you know mental mental condition. And we've been working, for example, on um, obsessive compulsive disorder uh, quite a bit. And um, one of the things I'm, I'm I ran out of time, uh, or I ran out of time, uh, so I'm not going to go into details. But for example, something that we um, uh, did uh, at the University of Hertfordshire is uh, working with a psychiatrist uh, to compare um, different uh, hypotheses on uh, what could give rise to compulsive behavior. So is it, is it a problem of not perceiving the stop signals? You can stop doing that. You have satisfied your need. You can stop. Or is it because uh, you know we just resort to habits? Uh, people with uh, compulsive behavior just resort to habits instead of having a goal-directed uh, behavior. Or, or what is the role of anxiety here? Okay, so that's something. Um, okay, quickly, uh, you know, under development. Uh, so some of the uh, you know questions that we can ask and try to answer. Uh, is which are the developmental steps and environmental factors uh, that are key for different elements, different aspects. Um, what is learning and emotional development, uh, for example? Uh, and some of the hypotheses that can be per tested in uh, programming testing in robots is how do attachment ones develop, what develops, uh, how the babies recognize, learn to recognize their caregivers or how the robots. 
um, what is the role of the caregiver and the baby in the emotional and cognitive development, um, et cetera, et cetera. What is the relation between infant and um, adult emotions? So um, yeah, it's uh, also been uh, working quite a bit on, uh, uh, well, my, and my students, um, on uh, modeling attachment bonds uh, based on starting with something as simple as imprinting and then um, moving on to add, um, use, use that to uh, you know, develop bonds using comfort and um, other effective elements um, in the interaction between a baby robot and a, um, and a human caregiver. Um, so I have, you know, um, we work with developmental psychologists to try to come up with um, you know, a model that could uh, be, explain uh, some elements of attachment in humans and uh, non different cultures and in the primates, uh, but also could be used to uh, guide, um, you know, the uh, um, development, cognitive development even uh, of the robots, so for example, learning in the, in the robots uh, as a function of interactions with with a caregiver. So I have a bunch of videos, so I'm not going to show them. Uh, okay, and just to finish last uh, slide, you know, some of the um, element questions that we can ask under evolution, and we can um, also test, for example, what, uh, which behavior or new form of behavior or emotional trait was a prerequisite for uh, another, or uh, what are the consequences of specific traits in further development? Um, so again, for example, mother-child bond was a phylogenetic precondition for social emotional bonds, but in addition to the original function, some elements of that bond, for example, grooming, became uh, elements of social emotional behavior. Uh, or physical aggression was a phylogenetic precondition of anger. And in addition to the original function, some elements of those uh, of aggression, pushing, hitting, became uh, elements of anger. Um, so yeah, these are some, some of the uh, things that we can uh, program in robust test. And I'm gonna stop here uh, and see whether people have uh, questions or uh, like to discuss some of the things that I presented. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lola, for this great talk. I really enjoy, I hope that everybody uh, joined as I did. So we have, um, we have uh, time for questions and comments. And